Action, take one. Hello and welcome to Meet Me at the Movies. Noel T. Manning the second here. And i got to say, uh, I really appreciate uh, having guests on this show. Uh, we've had Adam Long, if, you've, uh, if you're familiar with this show, if you've watched us, you know Adam Long has been a kind of a recurring guest from time to time. And one of the things I like about having guests uh, on the show is you get a chance to hear from a, a, a vi- variety of different uh, viewpoints, and it gives you a chance to uh, to explore the minds uh, and the hearts of, of others out there. And I really love that aspect. And something else is it's a networking opportunity. Uh, many times uh, I will be asked to, to be a part of something they're doing, and that recently happened with Adam. Uh, Adam has a, a segment on YouTube that you can find called Adam's Corner. Uh, and he invited me to come on and talk about someone that I've known for a long time, Mr. Earl Owensby. Uh, Earl and I uh, go back a number of years, and Adam wanted to talk about that relationship and talk about uh, Earl's films uh, and Earl's history. And so had a chance to do that, uh, and we thought, well, why not share that with you here on Meet Me at the Movies? And we may be doing more of this as we look at uh, Earl's uh, filmography going back to 1973. So hope you enjoy this conversation that uh, that I was on the other side where Adam was asking me questions uh, about things. So I hope you enjoy uh, this uh, Meet Me at the Movies special, um, special combination of Meet Me at the Movies and Adam's Corner as we talk Earl Owensby. Welcome again to another episode of Adam's Corner. Today I'm joined by... Not only a guest, but a good friend, Mr. Noel Thomas Manning. <laughs> he, he's uh, we've done a lot of things together over the years, and he is just um, a, a really good wealth of information, a good friend to have, and uh, we always enjoy bantering it up on his show. And so today, we are having him on to talk about somebody that is very important to the North Carolina film scene, I would say, and that's Earl Owensby who did something really unique in the 1970s, and we'll get to that here in just a bit. Uh, But Earl Owensby basically was the first independent filmmaker, I guess you would say the the best way to put it, uh, to do something of that nature in North Carolina. But uh, he's he's a legend around these parts, and uh, again, like I said, we'll we'll get into that. But uh, furthermore, you made a documentary... In 1997, I think was the release date on that about Earl and his career, and you can see in the video here the video version, the man, the myth, Earl Owensby. And uh, so, uh, before we get into his actual the nuts and bolts of his career, I just thought I would ask you how you got to know him first. Uh, I was just curious about that, how you connected with him. Adam, first, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me on your show. It's always good spending time with you, and uh, appreciate you inviting me to to be a part of this, to celebrate uh, Earl, uh, who uh, officially launched his uh, career uh, uh, in filmmaking. Come on, Earl Owensby, a, a kind of a North Carolina pioneer, a legendary pioneer for filmmaking. Uh, in uh, 1973, it was November 10th, 1973, was when he started making his very first film called Challenge. And uh, we'll, I know we're going to be covering some of that, but I'm just happy to be here as we talk about that and celebrate that. Uh, the way I met Earl Owensby was uh, I was working for uh, Shelby Headline News, which was a Headline News affiliate uh, back in the 90s. And uh, in 1993, it was the uh, celebration of Earl's 20th uh, anniversary uh, of starting uh, the studio. And it was my job uh, to go and uh, set up an interview and uh, and meet him. And that was the first time I'd ever met him. I'd heard of Earl for years, a really good friend of mine uh, growing up, grew up in Shelby. And so the, the first time I'd heard Earl's name was uh, when he was uh, uh, filming and working on the film called Rottweiler, uh, Dogs from Hell. And, and the, the catchphrase from that was Jaws with Paws. And, uh, <laughs> but a friend of mine was telling me about how 60 Minutes, CBS's 60 Minutes had come to Shelby to do this feature on Earl Owensby, this North Carolina filmmaker, and I'd never heard of Earl until that time. And so that was my first introduction, and, you know, hearing the stories from uh, from my friends named Jack Lewis, who grew up here in in Shelby, and hearing those Earl stories from here really intrigued me. And so when I got a chance to move to this area uh, in the uh, the late 80s, 
to go to Gardner Webb University, uh, continued to hear about Earl and met people who knew Earl, but it was 1993 was that first time I got a chance to, to meet him. And, and I remember picking up the phone to call and schedule an appointment uh, to see if I could get this interview. He picked up the phone. I'm like, okay, I'm calling this movie studio and, and the, you know, the guy himself is picking up the phone. <laughs> and that just really, you know, really surprised me. And uh, I told him who I was, introduced myself and said, I'd love to interview you uh, about your, you know, about your film career. He invited me over and we spent an hour on that first meeting, uh, just talking about his entire kind of film legacy at that time. And from from that point on, we, we became kind of fast friends. We, we really clicked. Uh, there was chemistry there from a standpoint of just a friendship that developed. Uh, and then uh, a few years later, uh, I, I, I wanted to kind of expand that research and the interviews I did um, in 93 and take it a step further. And that's where the documentary came out, uh, Earl Owens Be the Man, the Myth. And I got to interview a lot of uh, a lot of those who had worked with him over the years. And uh, the North Carolina Film Commissioner interviewed him at that time and interviewed Earl's ex-wives. That was some fun stuff there, I got to tell you. <laughs> isn't it always? Isn't it always? <laughs> yeah, I, um, I first became aware of Earl... My dad was a social worker in uh, Gaston County, which is not far from Cleveland County where the studios are based. And a lot of the people that my dad worked with that were in his Gaston County social services, they, on the side, they were involved in the uh, theater stuff, uh, you know, the the, um, local theater, I guess you would say. And a lot of these people, Earl had, somehow or another, he was connected to a lot of the people in the Gaston County theater scene, and he cast a lot of these people in his films. So my dad knew these people, they were friends of his that had been in Earl's films, and he would come home and uh, tell, talk about this friend was in Earl's film, and that friend was in Earl's film, and then uh, occasionally we would go to uh, like a Christmas or a Halloween party at, one, at these people's houses that my dad would bring me along as a kid, and so I would... I would go along with him, and they would talk about Earl. So it was, he was in the conversation. And then I remember the first Earl Owensby film I actually saw was in a theater in 1979. Uh, our local theater in Lincolnton, where I grew up, they were running Wolfman when it first came out. And so I was a big monster kid growing up. That was a big thing for me. And I got my mom to take me to see Wolfman. And so, yep, there it is. There it is right there. And I have not seen it in 44 years. I've got to tell you, I have not <laughs> wow. seen it. And I need to go back and rewatch. But my mother took me to see it and we thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, you know, I might feel differently now as we get older, you can see, but you know, when you're nine years old, or I guess maybe I was eight around the time I was th- in third grade, I really enjoyed it. And it wasn't long after that, that our local ABC affiliate, uh, WSOC here, uh, they would run on Saturday afternoons just films that they had, I guess, in their syndication package, and Challenge turned up on a Saturday afternoon. And so my dad and I watched that together. I was obviously too young to have seen Death Wish, and it's obviously a somewhat of a reworking of Death Wish because that's what Earl would do. And we'll and we'll uh, we, we can talk about what he would do in terms of the ch- projects he chose. He would kind of find a trend that was successful and and do his own version of it. And you can talk a little bit about that. You know, it's it's kind of definitely unique, not kind of definitely unique uh, what he managed to do uh, in, you know, rural North Carolina. (laughs) Yeah, you know, when you talk to Earl about uh, the the big question of why did you choose this area instead of, you know, trying to do it in Hollywood, and he said, you know, because this is where I live. I mean, that's his answer. This is where I lived. This was my home. Uh, I, I knew that you could do it. It was a it was a business. You could turn it into a factory, basically a movie factory. That was his concept. And he said from the beginning, he never set out to just make one movie. He wanted to create a movie studio. That was his goal from from the start. And the way he got the idea uh, was he uh, saw the movie um, Walking Tall was a big fan of that movie, like Billy Jack. He liked the, those kinds of films. But Walking Tall was filmed in McMinn Mill, Tennessee, and it was it was done on a very low budget, and it, it made quite a bit of money. Mm-hmm. And so Earl was thinking, well, hey, if they can do that in Tennessee, well, 
you know, Shelby, North Carolina is not that far removed from McMinnville, Tennessee. And so that's where he kind of got the idea. He had been a very successful uh, businessman on the outside, uh, industrial tools, and um, had found a way to make money. And, and Earl truly was a salesman uh, at heart and in mind and still is. I mean, when you look at the marketing of what he did, it was Earl. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that 60 Minutes spent time coming to Shelby, North Carolina for a, a, a week or so, interviewing uh, Earl and following him around uh, the, the set and, and being a part of this community to learn about it was just incredibly fascinating. And you can't imagine something like that happening. Uh, 60 Minutes at that time was, you know, the place to go for kind of that long form news. And uh, when, when that episode aired, that particular episode that featured Earl, uh, it was it was on the very same night as the Super Bowl. So that particular uh, audience for that, and remember at that time, 82, you know, you, cable was starting out, but not everybody had cable. Uh, so that the networks, the networks reigned still. And so that particular uh, episode of 60 Minutes that featured Earl was one of the highest watched that entire year. And, and, and Earl would say, yeah, because it was B. He's like, okay, it was because it was the Super Bowl, but you know, I'm going <laughs> to take a little bit of credit. you got to remember, you know, now when we think about North Carolina filmmaking, a lot of people think about Wilmington and think about that portion of it. But that only happened because of Earl and Earl uh, and Dino De Laurentiis came together and they were going to film a movie called Firestarter yeah. here uh, and they actually had, were going to use Earl's studios and uh, there was a little bit of a, a disagreement and you know talking to some of the people behind the scenes <laughs> they, they say you know Earl's talking uh, his uh, his southern cliffside and you've got Dino talking his, you know, his Italian and that, you know, you can't understand either one of them where they're going at each other. And and so finally, that movie ended up, uh, Firestarter ended up uh, being the start of creating this studio in Wilmington, North Carolina, that would have never happened had Earl not proved that you could make money and you could do it here uh, in North Carolina. And others continued to follow. And it was amazing, you know, 20th Century Fox came, uh, they they filmed a, um, they had a, a few films. One of those was called Ruben Ruben with Tom Conti, and uh, and that got some love. Kelly McGillis uh, in that uh, as well. That was shot in Shelby and uh, produced uh, through Earl's Studios. Even though it was a 20th Century Fox production, Earl was connected to it. And there were several of those that would lease out the studios because they knew, hey, you, you got it, you got something here. Now I'm gonna go back to Firestarter real quickly. Um, uh, uh, there were a lot of folks who had been cast. You're talking about those theater people. Uh, Earl did love to cast people who were in uh, community theaters, whether it was Charlotte, Gastonia, even in Shelby, for his projects. And uh, and even those that were uh, were TV personalities like Larry Sprinkle and Mike McKay, you know, they would show up uh, in Earl's films because they had voices, they had presence, they knew what to do in front of a camera. And, uh, and many of those that were cast initially in Firestarter and even some of the crew that were going to be working with Earl when it was coming through Earl's, once Dino took it, they went and followed Dino. And ultimately, that became kind of the, um, the launching point for many of these careers that they ended up going and working uh, in Hollywood circles. It's, it's a really fascinating story. And, and it's, it's one of those that it would be a fascinating movie uh, when you really think about all that happened and how it happened and, and all the odds that were stacked against it actually finding success. Thank you for watching this Meet Me at the Movies Adam's Corner special as we talk about Earl Owens B. Stick around. We'll be right back after this quick intermission. Won't you come and meet me at the movies? Won't you come and watch a film?
Nikki Bliss Carroll, your host for Cleveland Connections, the show that explores what's happening at Cleveland Community College. Join us as we sit down with members of faculty and staff to discuss programs of study, upcoming events, and other exciting campus news. We'll have a new show for you each month on C19 TV, or you can stream us online at c19.tv. Tune in and connect with Cleveland Community College on Cleveland Connection. Won't you come and meet me at the movies? Won't you come and watch it? So I hope you enjoy uh, this uh, Meet Me at the Movies special. Um, a special combination of Meet Me at the Movies and Adam's Corner as we talk Earl Owensby. Now, mister, you've got some nerve coming in here accusing one of our leading citizens of murder. Not one word of this can be backed up. What about the ledgers? Did you see the ledgers? I don't know what you're talking about. I do know this, though. I deal with trash like you day after day and year after year. That's all you'll ever be is trash because people like you never learn to play the game. And, and he came along at a a time when that sort of thing could be done he, he you know there's timing is definitely an element in anybody's success and he he came along at a time when the drive-in movie there was a market for specific types of films that were shown in drive-ins and his product fit the bill for what was demanded of of drive-in in, in drive-in theaters and that was a to me it's a magical time that it's long gone and will never come again and, you know, there's still drive-ins around, but they just show the normal programmers that you get in walk-in theaters. There were specific types of films. You know, exploitation is one genre that you would find. And his his kind of sort of borderlined on exploitation, I, I guess you would say. Although he was always careful to point out, no adult language in my films, you know. <laughs> there may be yeah. quite a bit of violence, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, you you wouldn't find the you wouldn't find uh, language, you wouldn't find uh, sex scenes, nudity, right, you yeah. wouldn't find that. I mean, uh, there were uh, several producers that uh, tried to come to his studios to get him to to shoot X-rated films, mm -hmm. adult films at the time, and he was like, "No, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it." Yeah, that's true. Yeah, all of his and, films were PG rated, I believe. From what, yeah, what yeah, I well, yeah, most of them PG. Now there were a few that um, ended up being released under like the unrated because Dark Sunday was one of those that had so much violence mm -hmm. that uh, the uh, Motion Picture Association of America at that time MPAA uh, decided to give it an X rating for violence, and right. so uh, Earl ended up taking uh, taking the MPAA to court. Uh, and basically argued that, hey, you know, if you compare mine to a, a Clint Eastwood film of, of the same type, you know, talk about comparisons, you, you look at the bullet hits, you look at the deaths here in this Eastwood film, which is a studio product, and then you look at mine, compare the two, and the violence is the same, and yet you're, you're going after the independents. And so basically, you know, he kind of proved his point. Uh, and they were they were going to give it an R rating, and so he decided. And he actually argued. Here's the funny thing: he argued for a G rating <laughs> on principle. He did it on principle. He argued yeah. for a G rating, and they and they ended up uh, saying, "Okay, we'll release it. We'll give it an R rating." And so he decided, "Now I'm going to release it with a with a basically um, unrated." Uh, and he did that with with a um, with that film, and then there was another slasher film that was shot. Uh, through uh, alums uh, uh, by alums uh, from the Earl Owensby uh, School of Filmmaking, I like to call it, and it was called Final Exam. Uh, and that one also went through the same kind of process that they were going to slap an X rating on it because of uh, violence. And so they ended up um, taking out some of the scenes where you, instead of seeing the close ups of the, the, the slasher, you know, going into somebody's chest with a sickle or whatever, um, they would show you know, the sickle coming down, but then they would cut to the aftermath of it. And so they ended up going, I think, from 18 deaths to 12 that you could see, and that got them, you know, a, a better a better rating. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, he, like I said, the timing was perfect for him in what he did, and that's, you know, and so uh, there was, and, and then later on the video era came along, and of course that changed things. The drive-in circuit 
was you know still around, as I said, but the the types of films that were unique to drive-ins were not, unfortunately. Yep. And so, like I said, it was a uh, it was a, it was a real unique time that he chose to embark on this uh, career path, and, and so. Yeah, and we'll talk, we can talk about some of the actual titles in his filmography. There, there's definitely there are definitely some interesting ones. We can just, um, but you know, we talked about Challenge, obviously, uh, is one of them. And then there was a, you talked about Dark Sunday. Uh, there's Death Driver, uh, Wolfman. We've spoken about, and then Living Legend, which is kind of a quasi reworking of the Elvis Presley story. <laughs> and we can discuss that one. My dad wanted to see that one really really badly and it we it just didn't play around here that i'm aware of or not not in theaters in my in, in lincoln and i don't remember you know I, I know it played um you know in places around the country but i interestingly enough not here and so it was only when it appeared on youtube that i was able to get my dad a copy of it and he finally got to see it and there were quite a few of his office mates that appeared there so in, in that one so uh, and the, but i guess it was ginger alden who was an actual girlfriend of elvis's who appears in the film. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it was based on uh, on the life and struggles of, of Elvis. I mean, if you watch it, even though the the, the character's name is Eli Canfield, uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it, you, can't, you can't help but look at it and know, okay, this is based on Elvis. So many aspects of, of the life of Elvis. And if you watched the Elvis film that came out, uh, you know, recently that got a lot of awards love, uh, back in, uh, what's that, 2022. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then you look at Living Legend, you're like, wow, okay, there's some incredible similarities, some truths there. And one of the things that, that I loved about a Living Legend is uh, Earl was able to uh, recruit Roy Orbison to record the soundtrack, an original soundtrack uh, for this film. And that's fascinating in itself. You know, at oh, that yeah. time, uh, Roy was kind of uh, in between his popularity before he, he kind of uh, relaunched his career uh, and went with the Traveling Wilburys and had that incredible uh, concert uh, documentary, uh, I think Roy Orbison and Black and White, a uh, Black and White Night um, that had a lot of guests on that. But this was kind of in between, and so it was a, a chance for Roy to do something new and do something different. And Roy lived uh, here in, in Shelby during the filming of this. And uh, I was speaking to Worth Keeter uh, recently, Worth Keeter was the director mm-hmm. for this particular film for uh, for Living Legend, and he talked about how uh, Roy would kind of be in the studio and they would be recording audio stuff, and then they would send Worth the you know the, the audio takes on on reel, and then he would have to try to put those things together and try to figure out okay now we've got to have this in a way that we can shoot it and, and let Earl because Earl played the title character lip sync to this, but when he was uh, piecing the stuff together he was like wait this doesn't quite sound like like Roy Orbison's voice it was because it didn't have that reverb that we all know Mm -hmm. when we think about Roy Orbison now there's this very specific reverb that when you listen to his songs there's something very distinctive about not just the voice not just the incredible voice Mm -hmm. but that little delay as well um and you know this film uh you know they had you know concert uh Concert shots that were recreated in the, the one of the old Charlotte Coliseums. They used Malcolm Brown Auditorium in Shelby, uh, and and you know, talking to Earl was just a fascinating story to tell because it was a drama. It was kind of a departure from the action, uh, you know, revenge pictures mm-hmm. that he had typically been a part of before. So Living Legend was definitely one of those that found success, and uh, the soundtrack actually got some love. I think it was the Academy of, of Country Music. Uh, or one of the country music associations was uh, nominated it for uh, soundtrack of the year that year, and and uh, and Earl said it lost out to, to you know a Willie Nelson film. So he said Willie did it to me. Willie did it to me. <laughs> that would have probably been Honeysuckle Rose, I guess. It might have been. I think it was because that was the same year. So yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I had forgotten about that because the previous year w- was the Elvis film with Kurt Russell, directed by John Carpenter, and Ronnie McDowell had done the uh, the the singing for that one. So I I couldn't remember if Ronnie McDowell stepped over to this one, but yeah, you just jogged my memory. I, I had forgotten, but yeah, yeah, you're right. This was before. Um, I think I read Roy's biography years ago, and it said that he had been reduced to playing state fairs. At this point in his career, which was kind of a big come down. Yeah, there it is. Uh, the uh, 
Ginger Alden, Earl Owensby, living legend. <laughs> I know, yes I know, when I hurt others with things I say or do, with remorse my voice calls out to you. It's me, Lord, I'm asking, what am I worth? Just a man made from clay to return to the earth. Through shame I hear you call, you may walk through doubt and but faith can still move mountains, amazing grace. would like to just say from a standpoint of it from Earl if you ever get a chance or ever had a chance to meet him uh, it, it is his charisma his energy his positive outlook and his uh, never say never attitude that I think continued to push him through those obstacles and those hurdles and those David versus Goliath moments uh, if you said, no, Earl, you can't do it, he said, watch, watch, watch me. And I love that about <laughs> his personality and that just capacity to say, y just give me a chance. You'll, you'll see. Yeah. I'll show you. I'll show you. The tenacity of a cockroach, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Good for him. We could all take a, a lesson or two from, from that uh, outlook on life. Really appreciate you all joining us right here on this Meet Me at the Movies Adam's Corner special crossover edition. Uh, Adam, you can find Adam Long's work. Uh, if you just search YouTube, look for Adam's Corner. Adam Long, you're going to find his work, uh, some of his great interviews, including one with, uh, with Kenneth Johnson, a creator who did a lot of TV um, back in the 70s and beyond. So I encourage you to go check that out uh, as well. Again, we do appreciate Adam inviting us on his show to talk about Earl Owensby. Uh, we're going to continue to celebrate the life of Earl Owensby, uh, looking back at his work, uh, his life, his films, uh, and his interactions going back to 1973 over the course of this next year or so. Uh, thanks for joining us right here on Meet Me in the Movies. Until next time, I'm Noel T. Manning II, and that's it. Many films to view until we meet Again. Next time we see you, we'll gladly fill you in. We'll tell about the happy and the sad ones. We'll talk about the good ones and the bad ones. Many films to view till we meet again.